Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk about what Dr. Jordan Peterson and Jesus Christ say about lies and lying. In order to do that, I'm going to be reading excerpts from Dr. Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief. And so the, I've done a little bit of editing so as to remove the uh, some of the psychological concepts that are a bit too complicated. Uh, but let me first say that I think that Maps of Meaning is a brilliant book. Dr. Peterson said that he put 15 years into it, and that depth of work that he and that depth of work that he put into it definitely shows. So uh, I urge you to read this book. Now, it is very, very tightly packed. And as a result of that, it might be daunting if you pick it up and see the small print. And so what I recommend you do, which is what I do as often as I can, is I read an audible.com version first. That makes it easier for me to just try to understand the concepts first. But what I found is that as I read the audible.com version, then I definitely also want to have the hardbound book in my hands. So I would urge you to purchase Maps of Meaning both in hard copy and in Audible. This is Maps of Meaning by Jordan B. Peterson. And the reason I'm referring it to it today is because at the end of this book, Dr. Peterson says some very, very important things about lies and lying. And since we have lying in our social structure today in spades, <laughs> it is absolutely necessary for us to think about these issues. And it goes right down to the very last things that Dr. Peterson is saying in his book. And therefore, I take them as sort of his summation of what he thinks is important here. So I'm going to begin on page 466. I've edited out a few things that relate to the psychological concepts per se to make them easier to understand for the purposes of this video. Carlos, it's a good thing that you have both. <laughs> but what I want you to refer to now is page 466, and then I'll, now I'll read. It is not the pursuit of empirical truth that has wreaked havoc upon the Christian worldview. It is confusion of empirical fact with moral truth. That... It is confusion with empirical fact, with moral truth, that has proved of great detriment to the latter. That is abdication of absolute personal responsibility. This responsibility means acceptance of the trials and tribulations associated with expression of unique individuality as well as respect for such expression in others. Such acceptance, expression, and respect requires courage in the absence of certainty and discipline in the smallest matters. Rejection of moral truth allows for rationalization of cowardly, destructive, degenerate self-indulgence. The lie above all else threatens the individual and the interpersonal. The lie is predicated upon the presupposition that the tragedy of individuality is unbearable, that human experience itself is evil. The individual lies because he is afraid, 
and it is not the lies he tells another that present the clearest danger, but the lies he tells himself. The root of social and individual psychopathology, the denial, the repression, is the lie. The most dangerous lie of all is devoted to denial of individual responsibility, denial of individual divinity. The idea of the divine individual took thousands of years to fully develop and is still constantly threatened by direct attack and insidious counter-movement. It is based upon realization that the individual is the locus of experience. All that we can know about reality we know through experience. It is therefore simplest to assume that all there is to it is therefore simplest to assume that all there is of reality is experience. Every individual is unique, is a set of, is a new set of experiences, a new universe, has been granted the ability to bring something new into being is capable of participating in the act of creation itself. It is the expression of this capacity for creative action that takes the tragic conditions of life. That it is the expression of this capacity for creative action that makes the tragic conditions. It is the expression of this capacity for creative action that makes the tragic conditions of life intolerable, bearable, or no, tolerable. I better read that again. <clears throat> it is the expression of this capacity for creative action that makes the tragic conditions of life tolerable, bearable, remarkable, miraculous. Interest is meaning. Meaning is manifestation of the divine individual adaptive path. The lie is abandonment of individual interest for safety. The lie is abandonment of individual interest for safety and security. <clears throat> the lie is fear's statement in the face of genuine experience. The lie weakens the individual. The abandonment of meaning ensures the adoption of a demonic mode of adaptation because the individual hates pointless pain and frustration and will work toward its destruction. This work constitutes revenge against existence rendered unbearable by pride. <clears throat> Now I'm going to skip ahead to page 468. Social and biological conditions define the boundaries of individual existence. The great lie is that meaning does not exist or that it is not important. When meaning is denied, hatred for life and the wish for its destruction inevitably follows. And so now I'm on the last page of Dr. Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning by Jordan B. Peterson. And I'm in the last half of the last page. And this is what he says in part, ex excerpted. <clears throat> These are the sayings which the living Jesus spoke. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over the all. Jesus said, If those who lead you say to you, See the kingdom, in, see the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If, you say, if they say to you, It is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. 
Rather, the kingdom is inside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. <clears throat> Jesus said, recognize what is your sight, and that and that <clears throat> Jesus said, recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you, for there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. And finally, Jesus said, do not tell lies and do not do what you hate, for all things are plain in the sight of heaven, for nothing hidden will be for nothing, hid, for nothing hidden will not become manifest, and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. Now, let me emphasize that last little bit one more time. This is, this is the last two sentences that Dr. Jordan Peterson is quoting in Maps of Meaning by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, and this is the very last two sentences in the book. Jesus said, Do not tell lies, and do not do what you hate, for all things are plain in the sight of heaven. For nothing hidden will not become manifest, and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. Okay, so that's it. I've been reading from Maps of Meaning by Jordan B. Peterson, and uh, it's a wonderful book. It, is probably a life's work to completely unbundle this book because Dr. Peterson has written a very dense book. But it is well worth your time. And if you're thinking about having a YouTube channel of your own, you might consider picking up this book and going through it sentence by sentence and trying to say, read a sentence and then try to say, what that sentence means to you. Dr. Peterson has definitely folded a huge amount of human knowledge into this book, and I urge you to read it. But particularly look at the last par um, but particularly look at the last chapter of it. Okay. Carlos Umana says, do you consider Jordan a Christian? Uh, I th think that uh, Jordan Peterson is a religious man in the context of Dr. Jung's oeuvre, and that is pan-religious, not only Christian. And if you want to understand what I mean by pan-religious, um, I think we should, I should refer you to, uh, just a moment, it'll take me a moment, but I will get you the quote, or the uh, link. I, I um, transcribed this lecture by Dr. Edward Edinger, and what he says in this lecture is that Dr. Jung identified the source of all religions, not only Christianity. And what I see of Dr. Oops, that, I guess I can't come through that large. Let me just give you... We're, we're limited to 200 characters here, so let me see what I can get on to this. Because the, okay, the link itself is rather long, so. Um, did I make it? Oh, I think I did. Okay, is that separated? Yes, it is. Okay, that should go then. All right, so there is the link. And um, 
what I recommend you do is read that transcript of Dr. Edinger's talk. There's also linked at that link uh, the actual video of Dr. Edinger's talk. And so if you ask me what I consider Jordan a Christian, uh, I would consider him a Christian in the context of this uh, interview with Dr. Edinger. And let's see. And uh, Carlos says, it's interesting that he quotes from Thomas. Of course it is. And uh, what Carlos is referring to is the fact that um, these quotes came from the Book of Thomas, which is part of the Nag Hammadi Library, which was not discovered until 1945. And it represents apocryphal books of the Bible that were suppressed by the Christian church. And La Crema Mosa asked, asked me, what is your opinion of Jordan Peterson? Um, my opinion of Jordan Peterson is that he is a brilliant man. He's way smarter than me. And perhaps that's partially because I never studied psychology generally. I only have studied the work of Dr. Jung in detail. And so Dr. Peterson has brought me into good understanding of a lot of psychological principles that I was not aware of before. Uh, I am an attorney and MBA, so my field was entirely over in the business field. And my only reservation about Dr. Peterson relates to his, what I regard as his, over, as his overemphasis on uh, the Logos, because the Logos is only the word, and um, this is a lot of words. The Bible is a lot of words. Okay, so this is the word from Jordan Peterson. The only trouble is that if you just have the logos and nothing else, then you have nothing at all. Then you might as well use this as a doorstop, okay? And so you have to put life into it. And a very good metaphor for this is a movie called The Giver. I urge you to watch this movie uh, because it begins in a community that is all logos. And the point is that it lacks all emotion and it lacks life. And the point of education is to prepare you for life. Okay, so the purpose of a professor like Jordan Peterson is to prepare you for life. But uh, then you have to go out and live your life and you can't live your life based on a pile of um, rules. And so I, my reservation was related to um, Dr. Peterson's 12 Rules of Life. Much of it is correct. I agree with 98% of it, but its emphasis on logos is inappropriate and not correct because I can assure you that when you have an argument with your wife, you're not going to be able to say, I'm right because of rule number seven that Dr. Peterson gave, you, gave me. Or you're not going to be able to go pull it off the shelf and remind yourself of rule number seven so that you can continue on the, in the argument. It doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. And so the key to um, understanding the significance of Dr. Peterson's work is it's only preparing you for your life in various ways, but then you have to go out and get a life. You actually have to have an experience of life, and that was one of the 
points that Dr. Jung emphasized that um, you can have lots of rules and lots of details, but until you actually experience something, you're not going to fully understand it. Um, so, let's see where I am here. So, Epic, you found this channel thanks to Jordan. I appreciate that. And I often refer to Jordan Peterson, and I think. As I said, I think he's a brilliant man and he's doing, he's providing a, an important service to the country as an, or to the world as an educator. Um, and I've expressed my reservations here. So that's that. Um, Carlos says, I've been steeped in reformed theology for several years from an Orthodox Christian perspective. One would have to identify Peterson as a non-Christian. Um, well, you know, that may be true, but I think that you need to um, go and refer to the link that I gave you above, uh, which is to Dr. Edinger's um, interview, and see if we don't have to start thinking uh, beyond individual religions. We have, to, we have to evolve into the next thing, and as long as we're doing this, comparing this religion to that religion, then we're going to have wars continually. But if we understand that um, Dr. Jung and Dr. Peterson are talking about the source of all religions, then you have something. Then you have something important. Um, So anyway, I'm sure it has greatly influenced your faith. I know a number of my followers also have become uh, better Christians because of uh, what they've learned from Dr. Jung's work, what, which I'm presenting here. And uh, I must say that I'm more a believer in Christianity today than I was a year ago. and. That isn't to say that I have to believe in all the magic things, the, the mythological things that are in Christianity. But what I do believe in is Christianity as a mechanism for mental hygiene, which developed organically, and therefore it works. And that is true of all the major religions, not only Christianity. Uh, Mr. Mr. Caleb NMH says Peterson has said more than once that we don't know what a feminized society will look like and that we don't have a map for such a development for such a de development thoughts well I think that Dr. Peterson uh, is equating logos with masculine and of course most societies have come up in uh, with a patriarchy per se and what we're now experiencing and this has been happening for over 150 years because uh, Susan B. Anthony in the United States started her efforts to win the vote for women only in 1862. And so while there were famous women uh, before 1862, obviously, people like Jeanne d'Arc and um, St. Teresa and many other saints of the Catholic Church, um, it's only since Susan B. Anthony that the feminine principle has started to work its way through in the collective unconscious and insisting on its representation. But what we have to understand is that we all have feminine aspects in our own psyche. This is a point that Dr. Jung made, and we have to learn how to balance the opposites in our own psyche. And this has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with sexual proclivity. It has to do with um, over the years, we've put um, 
masculine things in one basket and called them masculine and feminine things in another basket and called them feminine. But rea the reality is that all those psychological things are human. And so we need to rethink. We, we literally need to evolve into the next level of consciousness of our species. And that happened at the time of Christ. And it needs to happen again now. And we need to understand religions for what they are, which they're uh, systems of mental hygiene that developed organically over thousands of years. And they work. And it doesn't matter which one you follow because they all work. If they didn't work, they would have disappeared long ago. And what we have to understand is that when our politicians, or our theologians for that matter, try to divide us because we're not this religion or that religion, that's a political activity. That's not an activity about human consciousness. So, um, so Grace says, Dr. Peterson's work has strengthened my faith, but through my own implementation, likely the same for you, Carlos. And I agree with that entirely. And the word has become flesh, absolutely. I mean, and it has to become flesh. Um, <clears throat> and that's my point about um, that's my point about integrating these things into ourselves. As long as this is just a book by Jordan Peterson, um, it's a doorstop. It only does, and so it's, it's pure logos. There's no doubt about it, okay? But it doesn't mean anything. And I, I think back on my MBA program, for example, I used to kid about my MBA program that um, it was all statistics all the time. And basically, I went to the University of Rochester Business School, which follows the Chicago School approach. And so I would say it was 15 courses in statistics by different names. And that's absolutely true. <clears throat> and we were... Um, taught how statistics work, but from a big picture point of view. And so in a small business, you can't run a regression on a million data points. You can't. You have to make decisions based on five or ten data points at the very most often. And so I can honestly say that the details of what I learned in business school were totally useless to me. However, um, what I did learn in business school uh, came from a professor named Cliff Smith, who's still there. He was getting best professor awards back in the mid 70s when I was there. He's still there and he's still getting best professor awards, but he's about my age and so when he was 30, um, we were in a class one time and he gave an exam in finance that was a dastardly exam. It was very hard. And I had, a exec, had, I had an executive from New York Tell in my class who was probably 15 years older than we. And after the exam, I was standing in the hall chatting with Cliff about the exam and this man came out of the exam and he was furious at how hard this exam was and he chewed Cliff right up one side and down the other and said it was inappropriate blah 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 and uh, Cliff was from Georgia and therefore had a southern accent fairly thick at that time it's it's mellowed over the years <laughs> but um, but cliff had an answer for him <clears throat> and the answer was hey man if it wasn't tough it wouldn't be worth anything and so the point is that you have to learn through 
difficult study, but then you have to go and apply it to your own situation. And so what I did immediately after graduating from that business program, I went to Japan and ran a company for four years in four different, or for five years in four different industries. And in that time, we marketed 200 new products. We manufactured two products. And all of that was done um, under my leadership. And it started with zero. And by five years later, we were doing $10 million a year worth of business in Tokyo or in Japan in general. And I would not have been able to cope or to deal with the issues that came up to, to me in a foreign country, in a foreign language, um, in a foreign culture, if it had not been for that business school. So it was incredibly worth it. But all the facts that I learned, all the rules that I learned in that business school were entirely worth less. I never used a single one of them. I never ran a regression analysis. I have never run a regression analysis since 1979, but the value of the business school is in the process it puts one through. So anyway, um, so Carlos says, have you ever come across James B. Jordan? His brilliant also Peter Lethar. I'd love if Peterson interacted with those two. I know nothing about them. I'm sorry. Lacrima says he identified logos as truthful speech. I imagine it as a mechanism, perhaps the only mechanism to realize your potential or in Jungian terms, facilitate the process of individuation. Well, you need both. You, you, you need to get a life too. And so I always go back to this quote from Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which is in um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci. And Leonardo was an unstudied man. He didn't go to university and so on. And so he said, um, he who has access to the fountain and by that fountain, he meant the fountain of creativity. So he who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. And so in that metaphor, the water jar is the logos and the fountain is the eros or life itself. <clears throat> Gray says, yes, Tadinger explains more about Dr. Young in that video than can be grasped in reading and listening to Edinger. <laughs> Edinger is phenomenal, really. Gray says, I was told recently that I was the most religious, non-religious person that someone has ever encountered. Huge compliment, absolutely. Gray says, Skip has been big about putting this info together just like the dream where you were on the boat carrying dynamite. <laughs> the Prima says, do you guys find it difficult to respond to questions like, do you believe in God? After, re after reading people like Jung and Peterson, I avoid answering that question. Uh, La Crema, I answer the question as Dr. Jung answered it, which is, uh, I have no need to believe, I know. And it's actually only in the last two weeks that I've come back to the idea of belief per se, although I haven't changed the no experience thing because uh, you have to look at some of our videos here and my playlist called Breakthroughs to the Unconscious. That's the name of my playlist, Breakthroughs to the Unconscious and you will see actual religious experiences that I caught on video or on camera um, so that you can understand what I'm talking about. But once you have had an experience like that, then you have no need to believe you know. Um, but 
having said that now, I come back and I forget what I was looking at. I guess I've been looking at some Ken Wilber stuff and what, but I guess it was also Dr. Jung who said that um, religions are systems of mental hygiene which developed organically and you go with what works and so these were people who were developing religion over the last 5,000 years and they didn't have the scientific method except in the last 500 years and so they were trying to explain things in ways that they could understand and they created myths which have proven to be not true in the physical world but as Dr. Jung pointed out every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche it's not a statement of the physical world so when people want to say oh well that's not true because the scientific method proves that that isn't true uh, they are correct but it's still they're still incorrect because the statement exists in the psyche of religious persons and it's not clear how that part of the psyche works entirely but I know that it does work and so in that sense I believe in not only Christianity but every other major religion as a system of mental hygiene and it's worth following them because their um, their rituals have baked into them the things that we need in our unconscious and I can't say right now what all of those are but last Monday um, two days ago I guess it is <laughs> two nights ago I did a um, sort of a lecture on the divine drama and I'd go I'd ask you to go over and take a look at that video it's still in the top of the videos on the YouTube channel <clears throat> and so, so Muslim by choice says my God my God why have you forsaken me Matthew 27 46 was Jesus talking to himself um, Jesus was talking to his God image and so it depends on what you mean by himself I think he was talking to his self and what Dr. Jung pointed out over many years and very repetitiously is that we cannot human beings cannot discern the difference between the metaphysical God and the God image which he called the self or the archetype of the self which is the deepest archetype in human psychology so one cannot tell the difference between the God image and the metaphysical God of theologians and so um, I guess I wouldn't venture to guess what Jesus thought about it when he said that uh, what Dr. Jung said it was um, an intensely human moment in Jesus's life which proved that he was indeed the God man who he was both man and God in some sense but um, you know there's many videos on this channel about this uh, and uh, and I, I can't really go into them now but anyway they're here <clears throat> and uh, Nono says yes immensely how do you answer yes without sounding like what you believe in is a little man hiding in the sky watching your every move um, <clears throat> well I say it by saying I don't have to believe I know and unfortunately as Dr. Jung pointed out you can talk about this stuff until you're blue in the face and until you've had the experience uh, you're, you can't talk about it 
and you can't talk about it with someone who has not had the experience because they will not understand what you mean. And so I've been able over the last two years to catch a few examples of on video. And so you can go see those examples and see what I'm talking about. And they won't have the same impact to you that they had to me. But when I had those experiences, um, from then I knew. And uh, another time is when <clears throat> actually I saw the video of Dr. Jung being asked, do you believe in God? And Dr. Jung said, oh, very complicated. I have no need to believe, I know. And at that moment, I said, aha, I know too. And so then the process since seeing that video was working out what is it that we know and uh, if you haven't had such an experience you will have if you begin the individuation process uh, and but just be aware that when you start looking at the opposites and everything uh, the first thing that you can run into uh, is the shadow and that can be incarnate evil so you need to be sure that you're ego is strong enough to deal with that um, and the way you develop your ego is by going through the job archetype as many times as possible and that means um, if you're not making a mistake every day you're not trying hard enough because the job archetype says contest try to do something defeat have a defeat lament about the defeat and then be reborn into something else and as you go through that process multiple times you will strengthen your ego and you'll be able to handle the slings and arrows of life it's as simple as that <clears throat> and so um no god is not up there that's one of my favorite things to talk about NFL players running across the goal line and pointing up, um, they're pointing in the wrong direction. They have to point at their heart because it was their heart and their self that made them work out for all those hours in the gym and do all those runs and do all that practicing on the practice field. And it was only because of that, that their self that prepared them to make that touchdown. Simple as that. There's no uh, puppeteer in the sky that's making sure that you, you're you gonna be a college football hero or a high school football hero. <clears throat> um, Epic says, yes, I always answer, depends what you mean by God. Um, you know, that's, a, that's in my view, that's a, that's a cop-out answer. Um, you know, it, you have to provide an example to people, and providing that example means being confident in what you know of yourself, and so that answer probably I, I just that answer just wouldn't quite wash with me um, and it doesn't wash I mean Jordan Peterson has made that answer a number of times during interviews and so-called debates that he has on YouTube and it it just doesn't quite get there as far as I'm um, concerned FK says there is more gods not just one well, um, in the sense that there is a God image in every human being, there are 7.5 billion of them, and we cannot d differentiate any of them uh, from the metaphysical God of theology. So, um, so yes. 
what do you think about psychedelics? Um, I think that that is a cheater's way to try to have an experience, but um, you take your life in, in your hands when you try to use that cheater's way, and it may not work out the way you expect. We had 62,000 people killed by opioid addiction last year in the United States. That's 4,000 more than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. So we have a crisis in the United States with opioid addiction. So I think that um, you should avoid psychedelics uh, and only take them under very strict medical supervision if, if they are appropriate in some circumstances, which may be true. But if you're getting, on, getting them on the street from some pusher, then you know, ask the 71 people that dropped dead up in Boston a couple weeks ago what that's like. <clears throat> and Epic says, the mushroom is such a powerful guide when you're lost. I asked Peterson, why was the psychedelic experience so meaningful if meaning is a consequence of responsibility? And he said, they point the way. Um, okay, you know, <laughs> he's, he's a clinical psychologist and... Um, if he's prescribing something that based on his work as a clinical psychologist, that's one thing. I'm not a mental health professional, and so I'm not going to give you a, um, a statement that it's okay. I mean, you're taking your life in your hands if you're using drugs without knowing what you're doing. And, you know, as Jesus says, uh, Man, if you know what you're doing, then you're blessed. If you don't know, then you're a violator of the law. And um, so I would, I would just suggest that that's applicable in this situation. Mr. Caleb says, can you speak to the idea that the Logos concept in Christianity seems to be what is now eroding religious belief? Um, yes. Let me just, okay, this is a doorstop, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's got a, a lot of nice stories that were written by early Iron Age men who knew nothing about the scientific method, and the pastors that are selling this as physical truth and people who believe this as truth in the real world, the physical world, I mean, what we call the physical world um, that you can touch, um, that is a lie. And that's one of the reasons why I read this part of Dr. Peterson's book. Um, because it's obvious, and Dr. Edinger pointed it out in his, um, his various lectures. I mean, I'll give you his uh, individuation lecture, for example, which talks about how um, Christianity, or uh, God fell out of heaven into the psyche of man. <clears throat> and so, these things are not true in the physical world. They're true in the psychic world. And so in that sense, it's 100% true, as every other religious claim in the world is. And I refer you to paragraph 752 of Answer to Job, in which Dr. Jung says very clearly, um, Every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It is not a statement of the physis. And um, so that's what you have to remember. They are true in the psyche of many, 
and they have relative truth in the psyche of many. For example, I, I think of many things from Christianity as having truth to me, um, but I don't think it's magic. I think it's part of the way we function as human beings. And the metaphysical God, I believe that the metaphysical God is more like the collective unconscious, as Dr. Jung explained to the Reverend Dr. Uh, David Cox. If you go to the homepage of this YouTube channel, you'll find Dr. Jung's letter to the Reverend David Cox. And I think of it more in those ways than I think of it uh, as magic. <laughs> um, so, so yes, the, the Logos concept in the ex to the extent that it is being sold as absolute physical truth, um, that's killing Christianity, and Christianity needs to revivify itself in order to survive going forward. Aren't science and reality and rationality products of Logos? Uh, sure they are. Um, of course they are. And we need both. We certainly need Logos. I mean, if um, Logos masculine a masculine concept is perfection and that's also part of logos a feminine point of view is wholeness which is eros and there are certain circumstances in which we need perfect logos okay that includes any automobile you get into. If you get into a car, you expect it to go and stop and to do what you want it to do, and you expect it to do that perfectly. And if it doesn't do that perfectly, then you're not happy with it. And, uh, you know, I have a wristwatch here, and our wristwatches we expect to operate perfectly. Okay, well, mine doesn't operate perfectly anymore because it's a, it's a, a manual watch that I got 12 years ago or something like that. And so it loses a couple of minutes a day, um, but I still like it even though it's perfect. And I drove one car for 21 years, or it was 21 years old when we uh, stopped using it. And, um, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was whole and it did what, what uh, cars are supposed to do. But nonetheless, products we expect to be pretty perfect. Um, and so, you know, you can't sell um, somebody an automobile by saying, Oh, but it's it's whole. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. Okay, Miles says, Hi, Skip. Uh, religion is our attempt to attend to mental health. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I'm thinking this is at the core of my new position. I am not a Christian or anything else. Religion is not it. Uh, well, religion is a part of it. It's a part of human life, and it's a part of how, what we have to do to get along as human beings. And uh, Epic says, psychedelics may decrease the risk of opioid abuse, the association of psychedelic use and opioid use disorders among illicit users in the United States on Sage Pub. Okay, well, you know, I'm not going to endorse anything about that. I don't know anything about, um, I've never taken psychedelics and I have no opinion about them. Uh, I would just urge you to be very careful um, because uh, psychedelics in most cases, I believe, are coming out of unregulated laboratories and you cannot know what you're getting. And by the way, I've lost two people in my immediate um, knowledge, people that I know who died in the last 12 months because of opioid addiction. So 
Uh, I'm not going to endorse that. So Alien says uh, they're trying to conjunct external reality with DMT dimension at CERN. And I think that, you know, there may be something to that. I mean, Dr. Jung was working with uh, um, Pauli, I don't remember his first name at the moment, um, Wolfgang Pauli. But Dr. Jung worked with Wolfgang Pauli on the intersection between physics and psychology uh, very extensively over a period of more than 20 years. They passed letters back and forth, and those letters are contained in a book. And so if you're interested in that, I recommend that you uh, read it because uh, Wolfgang Pauli was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And, um, and Dr. Jung um, basically saved him because he was having mental disorder problems uh, in his late 20s. And Dr. Jung, uh, he became a patient of Dr. Jung's. And then over time, they exchanged notes about this very point. So it's worth paying attention to. Now, I regret it, but I have to terminate this session now because I have a class for the advanced reading group at 1.30 this afternoon that is conducted on Zoom. If you are interested in the advanced reading group and have not joined it yet, um, please send me an email at skip.conover at gmail.com. I will make a cutoff of uh, 12 noon today. If I have an email from you, by 12 noon, I can get you into today's session. Uh, we are completing uh, chapter five of ION, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self uh, by Dr. Jung, uh, which chapter five is about Christ as a symbol of the self. And so I'll be talking today about paragraphs 115 to 126. So. Uh, please feel free to join us then. Uh, just send an email to skip.conover at gmail.com and I will do my best to get you into today's session. Um, there is an understanding in the advanced reading group that you will become a supporter on Patreon. Um, and the details of that are in the uh, description underneath this video. So. Uh, okay, Epic, uh, I, I guess I would ask you to stop selling drugs on uh, this chat, and uh, thank you for your comment, but I have no idea what you're talking about, and it's not relevant to this discussion. Uh, this discussion is about lies and lying, or at least it started from that. <laughs> So see you later. Uh, I'm I'm going to sign off because I have to prepare for my class today at 1:30 Eastern U.S. time. So talk to you then.